Australia is more than meets the eye. Well, that's what we're going to find out. Uh, this is always interesting to me from a geography perspective when countries are more than just their mainland. There's a lot of other territories, islands, things like this uh, that technically uh, have been claimed or are part of the country. Uh, for example, there's a lot of territories that are part of the U.S. Uh, that many people here uh, don't actually know about sometimes. Uh, but I'm anxious to see what else is involved in the whole scope of Australia. This is from a channel called Why Do Countries Exist? It'll be linked in the description down below so you can watch the whole thing uninterrupted. And this is a Discord suggestion from Tgirl009. Let's go. Let's talk about the history of the external territories of Australia. The external territories are essentially all the territories of Australia that aren't connected to the main continent. In right. total, there are seven. However, I'll only really focus on three, as the rest are mostly uninhabited. For the remaining four, okay. I'll do a quick summary right now. First is the Australian Antarctic Territory. I talk more about this in my Antarctica <laughs> video, and I'd encourage you to check it out if you want to learn more. Pretty much is a part of... Boy, is all the pink Australia's uh, claim there? That is a lot. That is like half the continent of Antarctica, uh, which I, I'll go, you know, a little controversial here, but I'm pretty sure there's a treaty from many, many nations where uh, no one owns Antarctica, but uh, I know a lot of countries like to claim parts of it. Uh, Australia is not the only one. Part of Antarctica that to me it doesn't really count uh, because no one lives there. It, it definitely not inhabitable, so to say. It's claimed by Australia <laughs> and is mostly just used by researchers to study the continent. Right. Next is the territory of the Harold Islands and the McDonald Islands. It's a series of volcanic islands located in the Indian Ocean. Ooh. It is the only part of Australia that has an active volcano on it and has been used at various points since the 1850s as a sealing base and for radio tests. Wow. Next, we'll go to the Ashmore and Carter Islands, which are a series of reefs off the coast of northern Western Australia. It has been visited by humans since the 1700s, with Indonesian fishermen fishing off the reefs, and the wow. territory had been a mining camp for phosphate in the late 1800s. No kidding. Today, the islands have become infamous for being a popular smuggling spot for illegal immigration with smugglers dropping people off at the islands, thus technically putting them in Australian territory. Oh, wow. Finally, we'll go to the Coral Sea Islands. These islands are a series of islands in the Coral Sea off the coast of eastern Queensland. These islands actually have a small population of meteorologists who keep track of the weather, but most wow. islands in the territory remain uninhabited. Yeah, see, that's what's so interesting. Uh, this is the parts you don't really see on maps a lot, right? Is there's just so many land masses and islands that it, it's so, like, kind of mind-blowing that we all live our life and it seems busy sometimes especially maybe if you're near cities or something and uh there's so many spots in the world where there's just like nothing going on it's very bizarre uh refreshing in a way but also like freaky too i mean look at that there's tons of islands highlighted there and they're not too far from the mainland there's not civilization there for the most part it's really weird right <laughs> the territory contains in its borders the Great Barrier Reef, one of the most important wow, ecosystems that's in the cool. world and one of the prettiest spots in all of Australia. In 2004, the Coral Sea Islands was declared independent by a group of LGBT activists who wanted to protest the government refusing to legalize same-sex marriage in the country. The Micronation, the gay and lesbian kingdom of the Coral Sea Islands, what? was disbanded in 2017 after same-sex marriage was legalized in Australia. So now we'll go on to the three that's remaining That's fascinating. Territory. First we'll talk about the Cocos Island, or Keeling Island. It can be called both, but I'll use Cocos for this That's episode. way over there. The islands are located in the Indian Ocean, south of the Indonesian island of Sumatra. The islands are made up of a series of reefs, with the two populated reefs being West Island and Home Island. These two islands contain 544 people, with a population divided between 140 people living on West Island and 404 people living on Home Island. Wow. The population of these two islands is mostly made up of Cocos Malays, who are ethnic Malays and who arrived to the islands from Malaysia and primarily live on Home Island, and white people who primarily live on West Island. The islands were uninhabited Very fascinating. and had no human Again. settlement until 1826, when an English merchant, Alexander Hare, landed on the islands and decided that he wanted to build himself a place to live. Hare immediately went to work to bring a group of 40 Malay women to live with him in a harem. He lived in this prepubescent boy's fantasy for two years until a Scottish ship captain, John Clooney's Ross, arrived on the island with his family and a small group of sailors, hoping to settle on the island. Clooney's Ross and Hare would argue about who deserved to live on this island for three oh, years, man. until by 1831, all of Hare's women had decided to live among Clooney's Ross group, and Hare had left the island. Clunis Ross would begin the process of building up coconut plantations on the island, and began bringing in Malay workers to use as his dentured servants. The islands for a long wow. period of time were run in an almost feudal kingdom. Many of the Malay workers were tied to the land, with limited freedom and being paid little. Clunis Ross would begin Jeez. a kind of dynasty to run the plantation, with five different generations coming into power. 
the head of the family would often be called the king of the Cocos Islands, although this was mostly done in jest. The islands would become a part of the British Empire in 1857, and would remain under British rule for almost 100 years. The islands would see a minor naval battle during World War I, with the Australian light cruiser the Sydney facing off and sinking the German light cruiser the Edmund. No in kidding. World War II, the islands experienced a mutiny, as Sri Lankan troops stationed on the island revolted, hoping to work with the Japanese to secure Sri Lankan independence from the British. The mutiny was put down, and three of the ringleaders of the mutiny were executed, being the only British soldiers in World War II to be executed for mutiny. The islands would be transferred to Australia in 1955. In the 70s, the the Australian government began to grow more hostile towards the Colonies Ross family for their continued feudal practices, and after a UN mission to the islands began drawing criticism towards the Australian government, the family was forced to sell the islands to the Australian government, and their rule on the island was brought to an end. A referendum was held on what the future of the island should be, with the options of integrating into Australia, gaining free association with Australia, which means the islands would be quasi-independent, but still in a very close relation with the country, right. or out-and-out -out independence. Ultimately, integration with Australia won, with 88% of the vote. Since integration with Australia, the island's economy has moved primarily to tourism. The islands are currently struggling with problems of unemployment, as many of the Cocos Malays remain unemployed or in low-paying jobs. Many of the Cocos Malays argue that there is a glass ceiling or barrier to higher levels of employment in place against them. Currently, there is a movement to try and get these Cocos Malays to the status of indigenous Australians in an attempt to give them greater protections and land rights. Next, we'll go to Christmas time. Wow, um, there's definitely some bizarre history on some of these islands. Kind of a surprise of this video, right? I thought we'd just be simply looking at them. Uh, but getting some history pieces is very interesting, obviously, as well. See, next up is Christmas Island, which I do have, or I have seen, rather, on video a couple times. I know they have the crazy, uh, famous crab migration there. And uh, I think, like, some prisoner history or something. But, yeah, this is this is interesting. This is weird. This stuff you don't hear about a lot, or at least I haven't heard about a lot, even though I've really deep dived into Australia for a year now. Very bizarre. Located northeast of the Cocos Island and south of the Indonesian state of Lampung. The island has a larger population of around 1,800 people on the island. It is made up of a combination of ethnic Chinese, Malays, and white Australians. No group makes up a majority, with the island seemingly being relatively multicultural. The island was spotted in 1643, although not for the first time by either ethnic Malays or Europeans, by a group of English sailors on Christmas Day, which is perhaps unsurprisingly where the island gets its name. Gotcha. Out. The island will be annexed by Britain in 1888, with the first settlement being established by laborers from the Cocos Island who arrived to chop trees for lumber. The island's population would start to grow, as phosphate mining became the main economic resource on the island. Many workers from Malaysia, Australia, and Singapore were brought to the island to work in the mine as low-cost labor, while Australians arriving on the island operated in more administrative roles. During World War II, as the Japanese took over Indonesia and looked to weaken Australia and the Allied war effort, they turned their attention towards Christmas Island. In 1942, a group of Indian soldiers mutinied on the island, hoping the Japanese would help India gain its independence. If this sounds familiar, well, it's pretty much what happened in the Cocos Island. However, this time, wow. the mutineers were successful, and the day after the mutiny, a Japanese landing force arrived on the island, taking it. The Japanese would then occupy the island for the remainder of the war, forcing wow. the population, along with the mutineers, to mine phosphate for them. In I didn't realize a lot of these islands that we're, we're seeing featured here were part of World War II uh, with conflicts. It, it's That's something I, I never knew about. I would have never guessed that some of these small islands that seem so like tiny on a map, right, would be uh, a point of conflict. But, right, that's just that's human nature, I guess. Jeez, that, that's crazy. World War II had a lot of... A lot of angles, right? I mean, so many things going on spread across the globe. It's kind of bizarre. In late 1943, with the production of phosphate low, the Japanese decided to force over half the population off the island into prison camps on the Indonesian island of Java. I could not find wow. any information on what the conditions were for those in the prison camp, nor how many, slash, if any, died. Although, if the treatment of other POWs in Japanese care is anything to go off of, yeah. it probably wasn't enjoyable. Probably the wasn't. Be reoccupied by Britain after the war. Christmas Island would be given to Australia in 1958. Under Australian rule, the islands have seen phosphate mining along with the... Wow, that is a beautiful picture, by the way. Look at the water. Jeez, the water everywhere around Australia and these islands, too, is just, like, spectacular. Major Great picture. In the settlement and capital of the territory, Flying Fish Cove, dominate the local economy. The island's residents have primarily suffered from political apathy. One thing I didn't really talk about for the Cocos Islands is the fact that many of the political and administrative decisions that go on in the island aren't actually decided by the islanders themselves, but rather officials in Western Australia and Canberra. The island's population oh, wow. can vote in federal elections, but the population is so small that their vote really doesn't matter. Two more things about Christmas Island before yeah, talking about there the last it is. territory. First, one of the most famous events that occurs on the island is the migration of the island's crab population of several million crabs. The crabs that live on the island all move to the ocean so they can mate and lay their eggs. The trip to the beach is long, taking around a week for the crabs to complete, and very wow. often crossing over roads where hundreds of thousands will die from oncoming traffic or becoming prey to invasive ants. Secondly, I want to talk about a more infamous side of the island. If you watch my Australia episode, 
You may remember how I talk about immigration being a hot button issue in the country, with a lot of people trying to enter the country and there being a good amount of backlash towards increased immigration. Well, starting in 2001, a detention center for refugees entering the country was set up on the island, with new That's migrants what I heard, yeah. to enter Australia being detained there before they were often deported to the Pacific countries of Nauru or Papua New Guinea. The detention center gained a lot of flack, with alleged reports of mistreatments and several incidents of violence occurring Jeez. there. In 2018, the detention center was closed, but reopened back up in 2019. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it was used to quarantine Australian citizens arriving back into the country from China for a brief period of time. And finally, wow. we have Norfolk Island, located between Australia, New Zealand, and the French territory of New Caledonia. Oh, okay. Population-wise, it is slightly smaller than Christmas Island, with around 1,750 people living on Jeez, the island. that's so it weird. believe Polynesians first arrived at Norfolk Like, it's, it's not weird in a bad way, I just mean it's so different, like... Living on an island when so many people live on huge continents, right? Uh, you live on an island that's uh, super small, right? Super small. And you're there with only a thousand other people. Can you imagine that? You know, most people live in like neighborhoods or buildings or whatever, right? And there's a thousand people within a mile. You know what I mean? Like it is like so many people. Uh, in my case, I'm sure in a lot of people watching, you know, viewers case, uh, but then there are some people that live on an island and there's just a handful of people. It's like, it's just totally different. It's a totally different daily experience. <laughs> During the late Middle Ages, but little else was known of them. These Polynesian colonists only lived on the island for a few generations before either dying out or leaving the island. Norfolk was settled by Europeans starting in 1788 and was tied directly to the first European settlements in Australia. Norfolk was settled by a small number of convicts and soldiers who settled the island in order to grow flax and hemp plants, or otherwise known as cannabis. Flax was used really? to make sails, and hemp was used to make ropes. Sorry, stoners, no weed colony for you this episode. Yeah, <laughs> like hemp can be used for some super strong material, right? It, it's, uh, they're talking about like hemp rope, for example. Um, I'm surprised it's not used more, uh, unless it is, and maybe I'm not aware, but I wonder if it is still uh, part of Norfolk Island today. And I, I don't remember because... I'm sure some of you might know, like, obviously, like, cannabis is legal in quite a few states now in the U.S., but it's not federally legal yet. It's not nationwide legal, uh, but some states is totally legal. Here in Illinois, totally good to go legal. Uh, when we were down in New Mexico, totally good to go legal. You know what I'm saying? So is that a thing in Australia, or does it go state to state? Uh, comment that down below if you would like. The small colony would last until 1814, when the British decided to abandon the island due to it being so out of the way and really just useless. Just like stoners, am I right? The islands would be resettled in 1826, <laughs> again to be used as a penal colony. The islands for the next 30 years would earn a reputation as a terrible place to be sent away, with apparently only hardcore murders being sent there, although historians wow. today debate this reputation. Regardless, Norfolk Island would see a series of mutinies and riots occurring on the island, with the largest being the Cooking Pot Uprising in 1846, with over 1,000 convicts mutinying, killing four policemen and resulting in 12 convicts being executed. The <laughs> island's demographic makeup will completely change in 1856, when the descendants of the bounty Mutiny nerds will be settled on the island. For those who don't know what the Bounty Mutiny is, the short version is it's a famous mutiny that occurred on the British naval vessel, the Bounty. The ship's captain will be forced into a lifeboat and set adrift, and the mutineers would intermarry with several different Polynesian women. I'm skipping a lot of the details of the story, but the point is, by 1856, on the Pitcairn Islands, a small group of people of mixed ancestry, descended from English seamen and Polynesian women, lived there. The Pitcairn Islands were incredibly small and couldn't hold their population anymore, so a little under 200 of them left to settle in Norfolk Island. Around half of the population of the island today has at least some ancestry, with these half-white, half-Polynesian descendants. Wow. The rest of the island ethnically is mostly British, while most people on the island speak English. Among the half white half Polynesian community, around 24% speak a Creole language known as Norfolk. The language itself is a mixture of English, mainly older 18th century English, and Tahitian. The language no is kidding. in decline, with the UN itself naming the language as endangered. For the remainder of the 19th That's very century, interesting. the islands would be an important whaling base in the Pacific, with whaling and fishing dominating the island's economy. In 1913, the islands would be transferred to Australia. During World War II, the islands didn't suffer any attacks, unlike the previous two territories, but okay. they did serve <laughs> as an airbase for Allied forces and stationed a limited number of New Zealand troops. The islands by 1979 were given a large degree of self-autonomy, with little to no federal Australian interference. This all would start to change in the 2010s. Norfolk's economy entered a decline, and in 2013, the Australian government decided to introduce an income tax on the island in order for the islanders to apply for welfare and increase federal funds. In 2016, the autonomy would be reduced even more as the island found itself continuing to suffer economically. Norfolk finds its government and services becoming more and more integrated with the federal Australian government. This has led to increased resistance from the population, with the islanders complaining about the lack of say over local affairs and their limited right. ability to actually influence the politics of the country. This has led to some islanders to advocate for becoming a part of New Zealand or even becoming independent. So wow. why are these territories, uh. well, 
territories. I mean, for some, like the Ashmore and Carter Islands, it's kind of obvious. Nobody lives there. You can't form a country without a population. Right. But for the Cocos Islands, Christmas Island, and Norfolk Island, the answer lies primarily in just how small they are. If these three territories were to become independent, in terms of population, Christmas Island would become the fourth smallest, Norfolk Island would become the third smallest, and the Cocos Island would become the least populated country in the world. Even if they all banded That's together for some reason wild. to become one country, they still become the second least populated country in the world, with That's only crazy. Vatican City having less. These islands don't have a big enough population to be self-sustainable, and hey, need that's to be a, a part of that's a cool flag, though. That's larger neat. power in order to survive. <laughs> However, even though independence might be unrealistic, each of these three territories still demands greater autonomy, and wants to be treated as more than just an external territory, but as right. their own unique parts of Australia that can decide their own affairs and are respected. Whether or not this Unders happens understandable. still remains to be seen. So thank that you. That was for really, listening. really interesting. Uh, great suggestions from you guys, as always. Make sure to check out that whole video and that uh, channel with the link down below. I will be interested to see uh, your comments on this video, if you would like to weigh in on any of these. Uh, interesting how there's many islands that are under Australian... Uh, territories that aren't even inhabited. So that is pretty bizarre, right? <laughs> Just like empty land masses. Mind blown that there are tons of land that's not even inhabited. It's very, very interesting. Especially, uh, you know, from someone that grew up around Chicago where there is like you know, nine or 10 million people in our metro area. It's just like so many people in one spot. It's like, wow. Uh, but one thing that stands out is like, unfortunately, these islands really create some crazy conflicts too. That's kind of a sad reality, isn't it? Um, lots of, of sketchy history going on there. That's for sure. Uh, it seems to continue into present day just with uh, rights and taxes and rules and uh, their say or wanting to be independent, you know, it's definitely understandable. So that being said, y'all, if you like this or if maybe if you learned something new, I certainly did, uh, throw a thumbs up, a like on this video. I would appreciate it. It would help it out a lot. Of course, you can subscribe. Of course, you can subscribe to the channel. Join our amazing community we have here. We're on our way to 100K. I would appreciate that. And uh, that being said, y'all, my name is Ian. You're watching IW Rocker. And until next time, catch you later.